So, welcome everyone to this session on Arctic environmental change. My name is Eva Primer, if you only just arrived, but I, um, I'm really pleased to take a new role here as the moderator of this nice panel where we have also a lot of uh, information delivered to us and we will learn a lot about Arctic environmental change. Um, the purpose of the session is to learn a bit um, about um, environmental and climate change in the Arctic, its impact on the, the, the impact of climate change on environment, or new emerging risks, um, and link this to global change to um, audits. And um, we think we can think of the Arctic a little bit like a laboratory of climate change. So we, it's good to, in a way, um, scale up from there and think um, how climate change might go forward and, and what implications it might have and, and how this impacts the rest of the world. And, and you will probably be thinking from your own um, area and your own country's viewpoint. So like we already rehearsed a bit in the previous session, we have Slido. So maybe we, uh, is there a slide that shows the code again in case someone has only just arrived? And if not, I will read it if I remember it. <laughs> um, I will just read it. Ah, oh, it's just here. <laughs> Look, you can with your phone or your computer, if you're in the internet, you can go to this www.slido.com and put the code hashtag 22A20. 24 and and the, this will remain on the wall for a moment and there will be questions and an op possibly or then there is just a field where you can write comments and questions to the panelists so you can react to what you hear if you, if you want and and someone will be following this so that we can then um, as we go forward in, with the panel we can take some of those questions if we have time. I'm not promising, unfortunately, because um, I don't want to make promises that I'm not 100% sure I can keep. Okay, but before we um, go into sort of deeper discussion, we start with a keynote. And the first keynote is by Petteri Talas, who's the Director General of the Finnish Meteorological uh, Institute. And he has a very uh, long and esteemed career um, in different kinds of leadership roles. Um, he's an atmospheric scientist by background. And previously, he has only just returned to Finland. And previously, he was uh, the secretary general of the World Meteorological Institute. Or organization, I just say institute because of the <laughs> Finnish institute that is, is the sister institute for us. So thank you, Petteri, for correcting. World Meteorological Organization, uh, WMO. And uh, there he was for eight years. And before that, he was at the Finnish Meteorological Institute for 11 years. And now he has come back. And we in Finland are, of course, very happy to have Petteri back. And Petteri will uh, tell us about the latest science on um, climate change in the Arctic. So please, Petteri, the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to address you here. I hope that this mic works. You can, can you hear me? Yes, good. So uh, it's a pleasure to come back uh, back to Finland. And of course, this uh, climate here is quite challenging. So I've been towing away snow for 10 times already. And this evening, when I return back to Helsinki, I expect to see 25 centimeters of very thick uh, snow. And again, it will be good exercise for this evening. And those of you who are coming from Long distances, I'm sure that this is uh, quite, uh, quite a challenge to be here. But from the Finnish Meteorological Institute side, we have tuned the uh, temperature so that uh, it's, it's only uh, minus one now. It, it used to be minus 25 a couple of days ago. So enjoy this heat, heat, heat wave here. But can I get my slides up, please? So I will talk to you about the climate change and uh, before coming uh, to, to Finland, I was direct, uh, Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization, and we are the host agency of uh, IPCC, and I will show you some slides from WMO reports and uh, from also from most recent uh, IPCC reports. Next, please. You can even push the arrow in your... Okay, okay, that's fine. 
and, um, and, and, and at WMO we were audited by the Swiss and, uh, and, and the Italian uh, government uh, agencies and uh, in the United Nations there's lots of suspicion whether we are doing things in the right way and, uh, and here in Finland there's a little bit more trust I would say as compared to the United Nations uh, environment. So uh, uh, we know how this uh, planet is functioning and we can, we can uh, model it uh, with uh, climate models and, and weather forecasting models. But uh, now I will show you plenty of uh, observations uh, how, how, how things are moving ahead uh, worldwide. First of all, uh, we have broken records in main greenhouse gas concentrations year by year. Carbon dioxide, which is most important one, uh, methane and nitrous oxide, and we have also measurements here in, in Lapland. Uh, our main measurement site is uh, 300 kilometers north from here, uh, where we also monitor the same things. And, and we have seen the same, same trend worldwide because these gases have such a long lifetime. And at the moment we have about 150% more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as compared to the situation in the 18th century. And uh, we have seen an increase of, uh, of all, all of those gases, and most important one is, uh, is carbon dioxide. And this blue area here indicates uh, what is uh, coming from fossil fuels, and that's two-thirds of the, of the problem. About 20% of the problem is coming from methane, which is coming from tropical wetlands, uh, from cattle, and, and also from rice paddies. Those who are, of you who are vegans, uh, it's bad news that also rice is not very cli climate-friendly thing to, to eat. Sorry for those who are coming from, from Asia. And, and then about 10% of the problem is related to deforestation of tropical uh, forests in Amazonia region in Central Africa and Southern Asia. And, uh, and, and these fossil fuels are mostly used in, uh, in, in uh, big uh, economies in Europe, uh, in, in North America, and also in Asia. And, and this de deforestation issue is, is, is very much a tropical, tropical issue and, uh, and, and these uh, tropical rainforests uh, are not renewable forests as, as, as we, our forests here at our latitudes are. WMO just published its uh, uh, first report uh, for, from, for, for last year and, and you can see that we have again broken a uh, uh, less friendly record of temperature. We are already fairly close to 1.5 degrees which is the low limit of uh, Paris Agreement, and, and this year is most likely going to be again warmer, and uh, it's possible that we will break uh, this 1.5 degrees uh, record, at least on temporary basis. Uh, it's boosted by El Nino, which is uh, warming the Pacific uh, temperatures. And here we have three global maps. Use your imagination where are the Americas, where is, the, where is Africa and uh, Australia. And all these red uh, symbols on the map uh, show where we have seen an increase of heat waves. So practically the whole, whole planet has seen an increase of heat waves. These uh, green colors indicate areas where we have seen increase of flooding cases. Uh, and about half of the uh, planet has seen an increase of uh, flooding cases. And, and these orange symbols indicate where we have seen an increase of drought events. And, uh, and about one third of the planet has seen that. And for example, Western Europe has been faced to both of them. They have been experiencing both, both flooding and drought. For example, two last summers were very dry and, and warm in, in Europe. But uh, three years ago, we had very severe flooding problem in, in Germany and, uh, and Belgium. And we have stored more than 90% of the excess heat that we have produced to the planet uh, to ocean. And, and this seawater at all depths has, has been warming and we have more heat there, which means that we have, we have started seeing tropical storms uh, <coughs> at the wider areas than before. And, and we have also more humidity in the, in the atmosphere, about 10% more humidity because of this warming. And, and that means that when it rains, it rains more. So uh, the flooding risk is, uh, is growing. Here in the Arctic, we have seen the biggest changes, which was already said by the previous uh, speakers. And, uh, and Vladimir Putin is saying that it's four times the global average, uh, but uh, some of the others are saying it's double the global average. So far, it has been double, but it's a there's a potential to have four times in the future. And we have melted uh, already uh, more than 70% of the sea ice mass, and, and this ice-covered area is getting uh, smaller and smaller. 
And these changes in the Arctic, they are having impact on the weather patterns uh, in the whole northern hemisphere. We have started seeing more often stagnant weather conditions because of the Arctic warming. That means that the high pressure systems, which are more persistent, uh, which means in, in summertime heat waves and drought, and, and in wintertime these cold spells can be observed at lower latitudes than, than before. And, in, uh, and, and then the low pressure systems may be moving um, along the same track uh, day by day, and that was causing, for example, this Pakistani flooding, flooding case a uh, couple of uh, years ago. And new feature is, is that we have also started uh, melting the Antarctic uh, sea ice and also the glacier of Antarctica. So far, uh, uh, only the Arctic sea ice has been melting, but uh, the new feature is that, uh, that we have now record low amount of uh, Antarctic uh, sea ice. And globally, uh, the, all the mountain glaciers are melting and, and it's, it has been speeding up. And we expect that most of the mountain glaciers will be gone by the end of this century, which is going to be a challenge for the freshwater resources uh, world worldwide. And this graph shows what is the fraction of, uh, of water in rivers having the origin from, uh, from glaciers and how much is coming from, from uh, uh, rain, rainfall. And these dark blue colors indicate the, the fraction coming from rainfall and, and uh, light blue which is coming from, from uh, melting of glaciers. And once these glaciers will be gone, this light blue uh, part of the, of the symbol is, will be gone. So that means that we will have a growing amount of water shortages in, in Asia, in pa some parts of Europe, uh, both Americas uh, in the future. And we have melted uh, all uh, quite nicely this uh, Greenland glacier, uh, which is uh, the second biggest glacier worldwide after Antarctica. And if we would melt the whole Antarctic glacier, we could see 60, 60 meters sea level rise, and the Greenland uh, melting would mean seven meters of uh, sea level rise. And of course, this is alarming, and, and we have already lost this game. We have su such high concentration of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that, uh, uh, that melting of glaciers and sea level rise uh, won't be stopped uh, during the coming, coming centuries or even coming thousands of uh, years. And population growth is also one of our challenges, and if we overlay this water challenge with population growth uh, challenge, uh, we can see some very challenging areas uh, like Africa, Middle East, and some parts of uh, Asia, and, uh, and, and we should also uh, talk about this population growth uh, challenge. Sea level rise uh, has been doubled during the past uh, decades. It used to be about two millimeters per year, and recently we have seen numbers between four and, and, and five millimeters per year. And there's a growing component coming from this melting of, uh, of glaciers. And there's no return back to the milder climate of, uh, of last century. This graph is uh, showing it in, in uh, colors, and, and uh, you can see that, that the colors are very different. Uh, for the past century and uh, how the future lo looks like. If we are very successful, we could reach this very low scenario, which means 1.5 degrees, or low, which is 2 degrees, and uh, at the moment we are heading towards this intermediate uh, scale, which is about 2.5 to 3 degrees warming. But there's still hope that we could uh, reach lower numbers uh, in the future. And, and one of the challenges is that what's going to happen to vegetation and our agricultural capacity in the future. And, uh, and we, we, are all, we have already seen changes in the soil moisture worldwide. And, uh, and if we go to these higher numbers of warming, the situation is more dramatic. And, and both Americas, uh, Mediterranean region, Southern Africa, Eastern Asia, Australia, they have already faced this and, and they will anyhow face uh, challenges with uh, soil moisture, which means that uh, we will have more, more challenges with agriculture. Then uh, there are some areas uh, like high latitudes and, uh, and tropical part of Africa where we expect to see more rainfall and uh, more humidity in the future. A sea level rise, uh, we expect that it's, it's going to be a half meter to one meter per century, but NASA has shown it in some of their recent studies that there's even a risk to see 10 meters sea level rise by 2300. And finally, about mitigation, uh, this is our challenge at the moment. Uh, about 85% of, of the energy that we use for, 
for industry, for energy production, for transportation is based on fossil fuels, coal, oil and uh, natural gas. And only 15% is based on climate friendly solutions, nuclear energy, hydropower and uh, renewable energy. And to be successful in climate mitigation, we should revert those numbers during the coming, coming decades. Emissions have been growing and especially emissions from uh, Eastern Asia have been growing and we cannot solve uh, this problem as Europe alone. Europe is at the moment responsible for 7% of the global emissions and, uh, and, and, and we have to have global, global changes and, and these uh, richest countries, they have made uh, commitments to keep us even at this 1.5 degrees uh, forming rate, uh, but unfortunately some of the big uh, Asian economies and some BRICS countries haven't uh, done so, so far. And if you look backwards, uh, what, who has been responsible for this, uh, this warming? Here we have overlaid uh, the consumption of fossil fuels and uh, deforestation. And these uh, green colors indicate uh, the role of uh, fossil fuels, which is a dominant one, uh, mostly coming from North America and Europe. But if we take this deforestation into account, uh, these gray areas, for example, Latin America and Caribbean, a uh, very large fraction of their contribution has been coming from deforestation. And that's the case in, in most parts of the world. And that's also, also an issue that we should uh, talk about more. Europe is the only uh, part where we haven't uh, had that negative uh, uh, influence uh, as compared to the other regions. And then some words of hope, finally. Uh, uh, this, uh, the good news is that we have now quite attractive means to solve this problem. Uh, we have uh, the prices of solar and wind energy, they have been dropping under the prices of, uh, of uh, fossil fuels, and, and that's why we have quite a big boom going on worldwide to, to build uh, solar and wind energy. And uh, we have also been dropping the prices of uh, batteries and uh, electric vehicles, and there it's more and more of those coming to the market. So we have means to, to be successful, but uh, we have to speed up our mitigation efforts. And this is finally the, uh, the vision of uh, International Energy Agency, what, what should happen during the coming, coming years. And, uh, and their vision is that we should uh, uh, build more renewable energy, solar, wind, uh, biomass, uh, bio, modern bioenergy and hydropower, and then use also uh, carbon capture when, it, when we use uh, Fossil, fossil fuels, and, uh, and they are quite optimistic that we won't see this uh, three degrees warming in the future, but uh, something, something lower. That's all from my side, and I hope that this wasn't too depressive for you, and, um, and uh, I would like to you to treat the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services nicely once you inspect them in the future. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Petteri. Now it's um, pretty clear for us um, how important climate change mitigation is, combating climate change with, with collective efforts. And, and you can think of that from the viewpoint of your um, role and organization. Um, perhaps I will then ask Petteri, because um, meteorological services say, play such an important role in climate change adaptation as well, that I might ask you about adaptation if there is good time for discussion. Our next speaker um, is Lena Ylämononen. She's the executive director of the European Environment Agency. So um, she will be talking from the European perspective. She's a close colleague of mine. Um, she's an environmental professional by background and recently she worked at the Ministry of Environment of Finland where she was director general of climate and environmental protection. Um, and before that, she worked in the chemicals, European Chemicals Agency, ECHA, um, and also the European Commission. So she's in a good position to speak about the European um, environment and nature and climate change impacts on those. Unfortunately, Lena could not make it here, and we, she will be here um, through a video connection. So let us see how that works. Everything's worked so well thus far. So. Greetings from Copenhagen and European Environment Agency. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to have this presentation, although not being there in person with you. 
and sharing our perspectives on the Arctic and how climate change is impacting that region. For my presentation, you have already received an insightful presentation introduction by Petri Talas, so I try to focus more on the impact on ecosystems and the consequences of climate change on the communities, also some socioeconomic aspects. I will now move and share my uh, presentation. I hope it works. It's always exciting. So, you may already have heard and seen these graphs. The EU Copernicus Climate Change Service recently published its uh, global climate change highlights for 2023, and the results were both shocking and entirely expected. A combination of continuing increase in atmospheric CO2 and other greenhouse gases with an El Nino uh, cycle has led to an, another record year. Almost certainly the hottest the Earth has experienced in 100,000 years. And while concentrations of greenhouse gases continue to rise, so do global temperatures. And unwanted records uh, will continue to fall year on year. As one US-based scientist said last year, 2023 will almost certainly be one of the coldest years in this century. So enjoy it while it lasts. So what does that mean for the Arctic environment? Key indicators such as temperature, precipitation, snow cover, the ice, thickness and extent, and permafrost thaw, all these indicators show rapid and widespread changes already in the Arctic region. And important to note that Arctic is warming up about three times more fast than the global average. The Arctic is also experiencing an increase in extreme events. These include events of rapid sea ice loss, melting of the Greenland ice sheet, and wildfires. And while there has been an increase uh, in extreme high temperatures in this region, cold spells uh, are becoming rarer and rarer, almost uh, disappearing. The 15 days uh, or longer uh, cold spells have almost disappeared since uh, 2000 in the Arctic region. It is also important to note that the effects of Arctic change are felt far beyond the Arctic, and this can include, as you may already have heard, the global sea level rise, possible changes in ocean circulation, the potential for feedback loops that affect atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations, and of course, indirectly opportunities and risks associated with the opening of uh, new shipping routes and improved access to fossil fuel and mineral reserves. The latest projections um, show that annual mean surface ten air temperatures in Arctic will rise from 3.3 to 10 Celsius degrees above the average in years 1985 to 2014 by end of the century, meaning, for example, largely sea ice free Arctic in September occurring before 2050. Over the past 50 plus years, the Arctic has already warmed up considerably, leading to rapid uh, and widespread um, changes in the sea ice, land ice, permafrost, snow cover, and other physical features and characteristics of Arctic environment. And these changes and, um, and are transforming the Arctic ecosystems with far-reaching consequences. And of course, the climate change stressors are coupled with pressures from economic development a decline in biodiversity and the threat from invasive species. So there are also other stressors. All this is affecting the unique and fragile ecosystems throughout the Arctic region. Changing the productivity, seasonality, distribution and interactions of species and, and their ecosystems. In particular, ecosystems um, that are dependent on snow and ice are at risk. Sea ice extent has declined markedly. The extent of September Arctic sea ice declined by 43% between 1979 and 2019, while the remaining sea ice cover is now younger and thinner. 
reduce sea ice and snow cover have a, have a range of uh, impacts to our brine just a few is that increased uh, open water absorbs more heat leading to further loss of ice and it also absorbs more atmospheric co2 leading to increased ocean acidification and reduced sea ice results in bigger waves reaching the coasts causing coastal erosion and damage to infrastructure there are also, of course, I mean, impacts to animal species such as seal or polar bears or walrus, um, which depend on the sea ice to rest, hunt and mate. And at the same time, access increases for shipping, fishing, offshore uh, natural resource extraction. Meanwhile, reduced snow cover decreases reflection of solar radiation changes the amount of uh, and timing of fresh water flow during spring and summer. So increases also the incidence of droughts, wildfires and insect outbreaks and negatively affects hydropower generation. But many plants and animals in the Arctic actually depend on snow cover to survive. And for example, many plants require late lying snow cover to um, overwinter. Sea level rise. Uh, which is also, of course also happening in the Arctic, is, is another major concern. It can cause erosion to coastal areas and damage to ecosystems, not only in the Arctic, but also elsewhere in the globe. So this leads to increased flooding and damage to infrastructure, dispersion of harmful substances and displacement of people in low-lying areas. And then there is the loss of permafrost. Thawing permafrost increases damage to Arctic infrastructure and transport systems, including oil and gas pipelines with their unforeseen uh, consequences. Roads, houses and, and airports uh, runaways. And it also causes damage to ecosystems and can lead to release of additional greenhouse gases and historical deposits of harmful substances or even pathogens. The Arctic region is not isolated from global megatrends and crises of the world. The effect of the climate change on the Arctic can lead to increased activity and connectivity as well as increased pressures to the ecosystems. And whether we are talking about population pressures, risks of diseases and pandemic, technological change or competition to you know, for natural resources or increasing environmental pollution, or climate change itself, the Arctic region will see increased pressures arising from megatrends originating elsewhere from the world. Climate, climatic stressors also um, challenge the ecosystem resilience. So they pose this phenomenon poses a widespread risks for safety, health, and well-being, damaging infrastructure, as I have mentioned, causing economic impacts. To many many sectors, and while my, while some <clears throat> in increased economic activities might bring uh, growth in terms of new jobs and economic growth, many of these activities can have a negative impact um, on the environment and other traditional human activities. Commercial fisheries, aquaculture, and cruise tourism, as examples are expanding in, Ar in the Arctic and, uh, and they all have implications for coastal communities and livelihoods, vulnerable ecosystems and demand for even for search and rescue services. The Arctic already supplies the world with a significant amount of its natural gas and it's also uh, estimated to hold a large proportion of Earth's undiscovered oil and natural gas reserves. However, oil ex extraction uh, especially poses a considerable risk to Arctic ecosystems and communities. It can also threaten the fish and marine mammals that Arctic indigenous peoples depend on. Arctic shipping offers some opportunities, but also poses some risks. Here, of course, the EU and its member states and, and its Arctic partners can play a constructive role, for example, by shaping international standards and targets through international conventions, supporting the designation of shipping corridors with low environmental impact or helping to limit uh, shipping in sensitive areas at certain times. 
continue to support also the Arctic satellite systems for better satellites based Earth observation systems and continue to cooperate on assessing impacts from shipping and tourism. This January saw a decision by Norway to allow exploration for a deep sea mining in the Arctic and all in all mining in the Arctic region is a hot topic. Europe is a large importer of natural resources and minerals, and including from the European Arctic. And in this context, the EU and its member states can play a constructive role by ensuring that environmental, socioeconomic and um, assessments are taken into account in any future developments, and that special attention is given to the vulnerable environment, local issues and indigenous rights. Also by promoting the adoption of full value chain perspective, in which every stage from exploration through the mining, transport, processing, production, and recycling is included to address the social and environmental externalities. And also by supporting area-based management, which limits or prevents mining activities in particularly sensitive or ecologically important areas. Europe, of course, and the Arctic share um, geography, ecosystems and weather systems, climate systems, not to mention the long-standing historical and cultural and economic ties between the two regions. So Europe also bears some responsibility for the rapidly changing situation in the Arctic through, of course, imports of oil, gas, minerals, fish and other natural resources extracted from the region and emissions of greenhouse gases that contribute to rising uh, temperatures in, also in the Arctic region. Also long range pollution, atmospheric and other, including marine litter and plastics, and increased shipping and tourism. However, the Europe and the EU can also play a part in providing solutions to many of these challenges through integrated policy responses that protect the environment, mitigate climate change, strengthen the knowledge base and support sustainable development. And as a geopolitical power, the EU has a strategic and day-to-day -day interest, uh, both in the European Arctic and, and the broader Arctic region. The EU also has a fundamental interest in supporting multilateral cooperation in the Arctic and in working to ensure that it remains safe, sustainable, uh, peaceful and prosperous. Being a major economic player, it shares also the responsibility for global sustainable development, including in the Arctic region, and for the livelihood of inhabitants, including indigenous people. The EU has adopted an integrated EU Arctic policy and a number of EU member states, as well as close partners of the EU like Norway and Iceland, have now developed also national Arctic strategies and policy frameworks. And in this context, the EU and its member states can play a, a constructive role by continuing efforts, first of all, to mitigate climate change, working to ensure um, that best, best practices and guidelines are applied in economic activities, for example, and continue to drive regional development forward. And of course, also strengthen dialogue with Arctic indigenous peoples, organizations and, and environmental NGOs. All in all, climate change is already having a significant impact on the Arctic environment, and these impacts will increase over the coming years. So when considering sustainable development approaches in the region, it is really important to acknowledge the growing demands among Arctic uh, populations, indigenous or otherwise, for economic development, improved living conditions and higher health standards. And and also adaptation to the climate change. Creating job opportunities and allowing for industrial activities are not always necessarily incompatible with uh, safeguarding the environment, but of course, appropriate measures are needed to protect the environment and to avoid accidental effects from increased um, activities and use of living non-living resources. At least effects will ultimately have a more devastating impact uh, in the long, in the long term. So when seeking economic development opportunities, it is important to respect and take into account also the culture, languages and local and, and traditional practices of indigenous peoples 
before starting major new economic activities. Indigenous peoples have a long tradition of adapting to challenging and, 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 and also changing living conditions, and it will be important to properly respect and address their views and concerns. I conclude here my presentation. I really appreciate having had this opportunity and I wish you uh, having a very fruitful and useful session on this topic, which is very important. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Lena. And um, like I said, she's a close colleague of mine. So if you have messages to Lena, I can try to relay them as uh, together with Vivi. From here, um, we will not ask questions directly from Lena here now. And we go forward now to our uh, final keynote, after which we have um, smaller inputs in some way from around the world. But the final Finn speaking in this session is Sanna Kopra, uh, who is a researcher at the Arctic Center of University of Lapland, where she leads the Arctic International Re uh, Relations Research Team. And she's also a senior fellow at the Arctic Institute Center for Circumpolar Security Studies in Washington, DC, and an ad adjunct pr professor or docent, like we say in Finland, in international politics at University of Turku. And Sanna's research focuses on the geo Arctic geopolitics and global environmental politics, and that's what she will be talking about now, about um, the melting Arctic and its geopolitical implications, uh, interests to natural resources in the area, and the risks that they bear. So please, Sanna. Thank you. Perfect, it works. So my name is Sanna Kapran, and I come from the Arctic Center of University of Lapland. And I would like to start with the map, but I see that it's quite tiny, so I'm afraid you cannot really see the map. But uh, why I'm showing this map is that, uh, as we have heard, climate change is the most um, important security threat in the Arctic, but at the same time it uh, opens up new economic and, and uh, strategic uh, opportunities for countries in, in this area and also beyond uh, the region. And, and in this map, you see in purple color and blue color uh, the oil and gas um, reserves that the Arctic holds. In 2008, the U.S. Geological Survey estimated that uh, the Arctic holds about 13% of undiscovered uh, oil and 30% of undiscovered natural gas, um, and most of it is, is, is offshore. So, so uh, this is one of the reasons why we often see these media headlines that there's now new gold uh, gold trusts uh, in the Arctic or scramble for the Arctic or whatever uh, you want to call it, but it's because of the melting sea ice, there is, uh, it's easier access to exploit these natural resources, and it's also easier to ship uh, these uh, natural resources from the Arctic to, to the capitals uh, around the world. And in addition to uh, energy, there's of course also plenty of minerals, uh, especially rare earth, earth miner minerals that are used uh, to mm, you know, build batteries and other stuff that we need for green transition. So there's, because of climate change mitigation, there is also this booming interest in the Arctic. And in, the, in Europe, uh, most of the, the, the natural resources are, or oil resources are located in, in, in Russian, or in Russia, in Siberia, or uh, in the coast, coastal of uh, Norway. And then there are also very important oil and gas reserves in North America, both Canada and US, uh, Alaska. And uh, this is the other reason why there's so much uh, strategic, strategic interest towards the Arctic because of the melting sea ice. It's now easier to use this new, and also because of the, the development of technology, it's easier to use these new opening sea lines. The one that goes along the coast of Russia is already very much in use. And, and, and it's, uh, well, it goes in Russian waters, so Russia can kind of uh, dictate, dictate or define what kind of environmental standards you use or what kind of assistance by Russian, uh, Russian uh, icebreakers you need to use. And, and this is the route that the Chinese call the Polar Silk Road. So it offers a shorter route from, from Asia to uh, Central European markets. 
And then the other one is uh, Northwest Passage. It uh, go goes uh, in North America, and, and in, in the future, it also brings a shorter um, route from Asia to, to the, well, not only to North America, but also to Europe. And then finally, the third one is the Transpolar Sea Route that is uh, that goes in international waters, and it's especially of interest to the Chinese because it will offer them uh, not only the shorter route between Asia and Europe, but also the um, kind of a more freedom of action because they don't have to rely on Russian assistance, but they can work more independently. But of course, when you operate in these waters, you really have to have um, specific, uh, extensive, in-depth knowledge how to operate in these harsh, harsh environment because the weather conditions and, and light conditions won't change even though the, uh, um, the sea ice is melting. So it's still very harsh environment and there's so many risks related to Arctic shipping in the future as well. Uh, but even though you may see these headlines about uh, scramble for the Arctic, it doesn't mean that there's actually some kind of area that doesn't belong to anyone, that, that the Arctic would be, would be some kind of El Dorado, last frontier that we can now exploit. But actually there's no this kind of area. All the land belongs to, under the sovereignty of one of the Arctic, eight, one of the eight Arctic states, and also there are no uh, maritime uh, border disputes in the, uh, in the Arctic, apart from the one between Canada and the United States. But it's not likely that this dispute would be uh, settled in military um, means, but it's more about diplomatic um, um, dispute. And, and so it goes to the, uh, the uh, dispute over the extensive uh, self continental self-submissions. It's also diplomatic, legal, scientific dispute that is, is now uh, going on and it might int intensify in the coming years. But it's, there's no reason to expect that there would be some kind of military tension that would or originate in, from the Arctic uh, region as such. But if there is some kind of military conflict in the Ar Arctic, it's something that manifestation of great power uh, uh, competition or great power conflict um, elsewhere. Uh, and, and that's how it was in the, uh, during the Cold War. Uh, the Arctic was heavily militarized uh, because it was, uh, uh, it was this kind of theater of, of uh, great power competition between United States and Soviet Union. If there, was a, if there would have been conflict between them, the nuclear weapons would go uh, through the uh, North Pole, and same applies to today's conflicts, I mean, great power conflicts, if there was conflict between China and United States, or China, uh, sorry, United States and Russia, also nuclear weapons would go to North Pole, so the Arctic is still very important in terms of nuclear deterrence. Uh, but it, after the Cold War, it was uh, seen that uh, the Arctic uh, environmental protection is a shared interest among all the eight countries in the region, and uh, there's a strong, uh, strong incentive to work together, and that's why the Arctic Council was established uh, in 1996. And uh, the mandate of Arctic Council excludes uh, security, hard security questions, so it has been uh, easier to collaborate and hopefully also continue that cooperation in the coming years, despite all this uh, in this intensifying great power competition. And under the auspices of the Arctic Council, there have been uh, negotiated uh, three, uh, three uh, treaties, uh, namely focusing on maritime uh, search and rescue operations and marine oil pollution preparedness and then scientific cooperation. And another very important framework is this uh, Arctic Council framework for um, focusing on black carbon emission reduction. And then there is this uh, fisheries agreement that entered into force in 2021. And it's very important when it comes to the uh, fisheries in the Arctic. And uh, when it comes to shipping in the Arctic, of course, the very important milestone was uh, the establishment of this polar code by International Maritime Organization in 2017. Uh, but as I already mentioned, uh, great power rivalry has intensified over the past years, and, uh, but especially after the, the uh, full-scale attack of Russia in, in Ukraine, the uh, regional impacts in the Arctic have um, changed 
Uh, they have been quite dramatic. Uh, the, the Arctic Council, uh, well, the seven other Arctic states decided not to participate in the activities of the Arctic Council during uh, German cha chairmanship. Now Norway is the chair, chair and, and hopefully the uh, cooperation will continue in one or other form. But still, uh, great power rivalry makes it more and more difficult to uh, agree on, on new standards, new, new cooperation in environmental protection and sustainable development. And if uh, the great power rivalry uh, continues to increase, uh, we can expect that the Arctic will go, go, um, in the militarization of the Arctic, Arctic region will uh, continue. And one of the key, key aspects in this discussion is the role of China. There's a lot of speculation what are the motives of China in the Arctic and what it means to the um, uh, economic and political and military activities in the region. And of course, the NATO uh, will also play a more important role in the Arctic in the future because now, as in response to Russia's attack on Ukraine, Finland joined NATO last year, and the, the Sweden will probably follow in, in well soon, probably. And if you are interested in learning more about how the, how this uh, Russia's war in Ukraine has uh, impact Arctic cooperation, I recommend that you take a look at this report that we. Uh, produced, uh, if I remember correctly, it was <laughs> published last year. Uh, we, we wrote it for the Prime Minister of, of uh, Finland, Arctic Cooperation in a New Situation, analysis on the impacts of Russian war of aggression. And it's an uh, open access report. You can find it online. So as we heard, uh, the uh, Arctic uh, climate change is proceeding very fast in the Arctic region, and uh, Arctic Ocean will, the, the sea ice in the Arctic Ocean will melt very fast, and it will open up new economic opportunities, and we can expect that there's more commercial use, but also probably more military use of, of Arctic waters in the coming years. There's maritime trade, fishing, mineral and energy exploration, but there are also a lot of uh, new tourists coming up in the Arctic because they want to see the Arctic region before the glaciers melt, before the ice is gone. They want to see the, uh, the environment, uh, pristine environment in the Arctic. And that, of course, also contributes uh, very heavily on, on climate change because most of the people use airplanes uh, to come here. And, and this uh, increased human uh, presence in the Arctic waters, of course, uh, causes new kind of uh, pressure to the Arctic marine environment. There's more underwater noise, there's risk of oil spills, and also it's, uh, it, it poses risk to human beings themselves because the Arctic remains a remote area where it's very difficult to uh, search and rescue people if something happens, if there's some kind of accident. And uh, also the um, environmental cooperation in the Arctic is now very challenging because of, the, uh, of uh, Russia's war in Ukraine. And it's, it would be very important to find uh, ways to continue this collaboration because otherwise it would be very difficult to agree on new environmental standards and how, how, how we can protect the pristine Arctic uh, environment. And as we heard, climate change is the most, still most important security risks in the Arctic region, region despite all this uh, great power rivalry. But at the same time, it causes, the mitigation of climate change also causes some, some challenges, some local tensions in the Arctic region because, because of the land use. Uh, there's uh, competing interests uh, regarding land use. There are mined, uh, wilt, uh, wilt mines, uh, sorry, wilt mills, and, and um, these mining operations that uh, harm uh, local people's uh, livelihoods, like uh, reindeer herding and, and so on and so forth. So uh, the climate change and its mitigation is really the key question when it comes to the future of the Arctic. Thank you. Thank you, Sanna. Like in the, in the opening session, we heard that um, um, tensions and, and resilience are very important, but um, environmental challenges are, are even more existential. But here from Sanna's talk, we really hear how they are intertwined and we cannot really separate environmental challenges from, from geopolitical and, and trade and, and other um, really important issues.
Okay, so this um, session was designed as a panel, and with the, after these um, wonderful keynotes, um, we will still, uh, by the way, we are not leaving the PowerPoint slides just to balance this that Petteri Vorimaki has never tried slides, so we will have <laughs> more slides. But um, we have two um, participants from, um, uh, first we have Jerry DeMarco who comes from uh, Canada. He's the Commissioner of Environment and Sustainable Development in the Canadian Audit Office and a nature lover. I already met him last night and he had gone bird watching in Finland over the weekend. <laughs> and um, Jerry is a leading Canadian expert in environmental policy and law. And uh, before Jerry, we will have Michael Kurs Sörensen, who is from the National Audit Office in Denmark. And Michael has um, uh, been working on environmental audits since 2017, and he has the expertise in the fields of regulation of pesticides, agricultural subsidies, the fuss, which we always pollute something, yeah. Um, anyway, really harmful substances that um, accumulate gradually in the environment and also in our bodies, <laughs> and various topics on energy uh, security. So he's a multidisciplinary environmental background person. And um, preparing for this meeting, the SAI Finland was looking at um, who has done environmental audits in the Arctic and, and ha that has anyone done this? And uh, Michael was the only one who has done something like this, or the, <laughs> the Denmark has done this. And now we will uh, invite Michael to share a little bit about this audit. It will be very exciting for us bridging the work of auditing to the, what we have heard before. Please, Michael. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be able to present one of the uh, audits um, that the SAI of Denmark has uh, conducted in the field of Arctic uh, auditing. Um, let me just start with a disclaimer. I'm not an expert in doing PowerPoint shows either, so uh, it's a rather ugly presentation, but uh, I hope it'll be interesting for you all. And uh, the second disclaimer is that I'm old, but I'm not that old. So. This audit was uh, conducted in 2013, actually, and I was not even employed at the Danish SAI at that point. So I was not actually piloting the project, but uh, I'm very well into the case. And we've been following up on the audit until uh, 2023. Um, and let me start by... Yes. Uh. It's that one. Thank you. That works. So let me start by, we had the, these two uh, fantastic presentations uh, that give a, a nice context for what I'm going to talk about now. And uh, so um, what can we do? What's the role of an auditing institution regarding uh, auditing the climate change and auditing Arctic conditions? So what we were told just before is that, I mean, climate change is a, is a fact in the Arctic and it, uh, it creates different, a, a different set of conditions that governments have to navigate in. And uh, climate change can be observed directly in, in, the, in the coast of Greenland. Um, the average uh, sea ice extent declines um, continually measured against the median period, uh, 1980 to 2011. And um, this sea ice decline makes new possibilities. We also heard about mining, oil and gas industry, fisheries, increase in naval transport, but also in tourism in the Arctic region. So the role of an audit in this, uh, in this changing environment uh, could be to measure or uh, to undertake an, uh, a study of the performance of governments in these changing conditions. How do they deal with, uh, with controlling uh, increased fishing possibilities? How do they regulate oil and gas? How do they uh, support a search and rescue mission if a cruise ship struck uh, an iceberg and things like that? So I think that's the uh, the role of the audit institution is to hold governments accountable to these new environments. 
Yes. So, our point of departure in the uh, audit that we undertook was to examine what the government did in these changing conditions. How do they uh, create the conditions for safe naval uh, activity in the Arctic, especially in the coast of Greenland, where Denmark is responsible? You saw the nice map before. Denmark is a very small country, but we are but the Commonwealth of Denmark is rather large because we still uh, have um, uh, regulation of the uh, Greenlandish waters. Um, so that is why we also in the Arctic Council. Uh, and um, so you can see that uh, Denmark is an actually a very small country. And that's because that we have, once we were a great power in the Baltic region, but in, during the 700 until uh, maybe 860, we lost almost every war that we could. And that's why we ended up, this is a small country, but we have a still a, a rather big commonwealth. And uh, the Danish Ministry of Defense, for instance, um, and the Naval Authority sets the conditions for safe naval activity. So our point of departure was, how are they dealing with these changing conditions in Greenland? Um, and this also affects search and rescue operations. And they also have the task of enforcing environmental rules in the Arctic environment. So see, here we have um, a container vessel that struck a reef near Greenland in 2011. This one is not stable. So, um, And uh, so this is one of the points of departure. So how do the Danish authorities deal with these types of accidents? If a ship like this struck a reef and oil comes out or they drop some uh, toxic waste in the, in the waters, what are the response and how quick are they? And this is an example of increased tourism in the Arctic. So you have all seen Titanic with Kate and Leo, and this could be uh, another Titanic, but these types of cruise ships have much more capacity than the old Titanic in 1912. There can be around 3,500 people on this uh, ship here. And so it's important that the Danish government, especially the Ministry of Defense, knows what to do in their plan to do something in case of an emergency in the Arctic region. So that was what we audited. And these are our, our audit questions. They, uh, of course, come from our, um, the topics that I just listed before. Um, and I'll, I don't have much time, so I'll hurry up a bit. Yeah. Um, so the major findings, the results of the audit were the following. So we concluded that uh, the naval authority in Denmark, they failed to uh, produce enough sea maps so that uh, ships could navigate safely in these, those waters. So it's of course important that you have some reliable sea maps when you have to navigate a cruise ship around uh, these icebergs. Um, and the Ministry of Defense had too, too small a fleet of vessels that are capable of mapping the sea. And the consequence was that it was uh, too low productivity in creating these new types of maps and how to navigate the sea. And uh, also the Danish Naval Authority, um, they should clarify what the regulations are, both in those waters that the Danish government are controlling directly and also trying to push for an international agreement on how to prevent accidents with ships in Greenlandic waters. And that was later in 2017, the International Maritime Organization produced this code uh, for how to navigate vessels in the Arctic region. Um, regarding search and rescue, that was a bit troublesome actually. Um, the Danish defense had outdated equipment. They were not really suitable for Arctic environment. Uh, so that was uh, not so uh, good for <laughs> if anything was to be happening with this Kate and Leo accident in the Arctic. And most of the equipment that were actually suitable for, for conducting search and rescue operations was located in Denmark. Uh, and that's uh, a bit far away if something happens and you have to uh, be on rapid alert. And then we also found that there was no clear division of labor between the local authorities in Greenland and the Ministry of Defense in Denmark. So no one actually knew what the demarcation line was when the 
Greenlandic authorities would take care of an accident uh, when the Danish authorities would do it. And we could also, we also found that the Danish uh, Ministry of Defense that's responsible for environmental um, surveillance or uh, enforcing environmental rules in the Arctic, they did not really prioritize that assignment. So that was also uh, one of the findings of the audit. And uh, that can be also be a problem because with increased activity in the Arctic, though the risk of environmental pollution uh, increases significantly. So, and this is the, some of the equipment that the Danish government uses for, uh, for environmental monitoring in the Arctic. Um, and then what we do in Denmark is that we present the report and then you have a follow-up on the audit. So the minister tells about what they plan to do on all the audit findings that we have. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, we uh, examine whether or not they have done what they promised. And uh, to make it short, uh, they have done, we closed the case in uh, 2023. And they have now uh, passed a new regulation for, for conducting naval travel in uh, the Greenlandic uh, areas. They have uh, also... Um, made uh, a lot more equipment available in Greenland if accidents occur, and ships that are passing through the Greenlandic waters have to uh, notify the authorities uh, and, and to tell them which uh, assistance they could get if they were to be in trouble at some point. So that's uh, also a, a good thing. Um, yeah, and I think I'll stop here already too much time, so I can see that uh, Eva is getting a bit nervous here. Yeah. But uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much for this. Thank you, Michael. Now, I, I now feel you, you can take a seat here and we can relax and we will get more microphones, I hope. Yeah, um, I now understand how, how scary it is to be a target of audit. You need to buy new boats and you need to make up <laughs> new plans for, for rescue and so on. Sounds very big. The consequences sound very big and, and, and scary. So um, we have gathered this panel here, so I will now go forward so that we would like, uh, so that we get a little bit of exchange. And, and I hand over to Jerry, Jerry DeMarco, who is from Canada, and like my, this might sound quite Europe-centric, and, and we have described the issues looking from Finland and from Europe. Um, how does it sound to you, Jerry, um, is it similar or is it somehow different if you want to describe a little bit how it is for you? I think it's on, we hope. Not yet? <laughs> no worries, and it's, we can swap, so number one is on. Okay, so thank you very much and thank you for inviting me to, uh, to speak to uh, all of our distinguished uh, delegates and speakers today. Um, I'm going to start to uh, talk about some of the similarities and differences. So one of the differences um, is uh, the time zone. So uh, I should be sleeping now. And uh, as a recovering lawyer, I've often been told to be careful about not putting the audience to sleep uh, as a, as a long-winded lawyer. So I have to be careful not to put myself to sleep, too, because uh, it's the middle of the night back home in Canada. Um, so uh, very similar issues. Um, uh, the one we just left off, off on, um, we have uh, in Canada a focus on security issues in the Arctic. Um, we saw the, the map of the, uh, of the potential opening of the Northwest Passage in terms of shipping lanes and the uh, significance that may have, and also access to natural resources such as oil and gas and fisheries. So we have that issue in common. Um, we also have in common with the European Union and Canada the uh, recognition of the importance of working with indigenous peoples in the Arctic, and uh, we'll get into that a little bit later in the, in the panel discussion. And also another similarity is um, that the Arctic region is experiencing similar impacts in Canada from climate change such as reduced permafrost. So for those of you who are not familiar with that in l many of the northern parts of the world, the soil is underlain by, by ice or, or uh, 
and that is melting, I, even though it could be stable for thousands of years, is now melting. So when we were all up here for the picture, all hundred of us, imagine if the stage had been supported by rapidly melting ice, we wouldn't have felt secure. Actually, some of us didn't feel that secure anyway with all of us <laughs> up on the stage, but if it had been uh, melting ice under us, I think we would have been less secure. So that's happening uh, at a rapid rate, and the warming uh, trend worldwide is happening much faster in the polar regions. And that's similar here as it is in Canada. Uh, and we also have some similarities in terms of the biodiversity. So um, many of you know, of the, you know the iconic polar bear, the white bear in uh, Canada's Arctic, also found in Svalbard, which I think is part of Norway um, in, uh, in Europe. And, uh, and of course, uh, reindeer. So I have um, reindeer on my right sock here. I don't have a PowerPoint, but I do have uh, visual aid with these socks. I have reindeer on my right sock, and I have caribou on my left sock. So caribou in Canada and reindeer in Europe, they're actually the same species, so they are matching socks, but we call, <laughs> we call one reindeer and we call one caribou. Um, so there are many similarities. Um, I'll quickly move on to some facts about Canada that you may not be familiar with. Most people associate Canada with ice hockey and so on, but uh, here's a few other things. Some, some uh, interesting facts and some, some troubling facts when we get into the socioeconomic issues. So about a quarter of the global Arctic is in Canada, and about uh, close to 40% of the land mass that is in the Arctic is in Canada. Um, Canada extends, like Greenland, Canada's land mass extends fairly close um, up to the, towards the North Pole, um, and the, uh, the amount of ocean coverage is a little less north of Greenland and Canada as it is compared to, to uh, Russia and Europe. Um, Canada is divided into 10 provinces that occupy the, all of the southern part of Canada, and three territories which have a different governing system across the north. So the Arctic region, which in Canada we count from about 60 degrees latitude north, so further south than we are now, uh, 60 degrees north, we consider the, uh, the Canada's Arctic, so that's the three territories and a very small bits of two of the provinces. Uh, as you saw from many of the maps that we've seen, most of, or a lot of Canada's Arctic is comprised of small and large islands, so it's a little bit different than m much of the rest of the Arctic. Um, about 52,000 uh, islands m in Canada, many, many of which are in the Arctic, and for that reason, Canada has the largest coastline in the world al along the three um, oceans, the Arctic, Pacific, and Atlantic. Um, and, um, and despite that fairly large land mass in Canada, uh, less than one third of 1% of Canada's population lives in the Arctic. So just over 100,000 people, 118,000 people out of 40 million um, live in the, in the three territories that comprise the majority of Canada's Arctic. And most importantly is that, uh, unlike most of the rest of the country, the indigenous portion of the population is quite high. So in the eastern territory of Nunavut, 85% of the population is indigenous, 50% uh, in the Northwest Territories, which is the Central Territory, and tw over 20% in the Yukon Territory, which is the Western one. Whereas the rest of Canada is only 4.8% in terms of indigenous population. Um, uh, I mentioned there'd be some, some uh, troubling statistics that, we, that I would like to share with you today. Uh, we heard this morning about the, the vulnerable position of indigenous peoples in reference to, the, uh, to Europe. Um, one in five uh, people living in the territories in Canada are below the poverty line, which is very unfortunate. The rest of Canada, it's only 7%. Um, and in the rest, in most of Canada, there's only about 6% of the people with uh, housing issues in terms of in inadequate housing, but in the territories, it uh, ranges from 12 to 26% across the three territories. And there are other issues with respect to food insecurity much higher in the north than it is in the south of Canada. Canada is working to address the, the historical disproportionate impacts on northern and indigenous communities through the United Nations uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and the Domestic Truth and Reconciliation Commission recommendations. Um, a few other uh, short uh, points to make in terms of environmental changes in Canada's Arctic. Um, I mentioned the reduced permafrost impacts on, on marine and terrestrial an animals. One particular uh, issue that's prominent in Canada is that 
Uh, many of the key roads in the north are ice roads in northern Canada, and they have no access during the uh, summer. All of the materials are shipped during the ice road season, and the ice road season is now uh, diminishing quite uh, significantly um, because of the reduced um, permafrost and, uh, and the warmer winters. Um, and in the southern part of Canada's Arctic, we are now experiencing uh, much more wildfire, uh, forest fires, uh, the smoke from which we share uh, generously with the uh, northern United States has happened last year. Um, but it is a very serious issue for the southern part of Canada's Arctic, which, which uh, is treed, whereas the northern part is, is uh, treeless. Um, in terms of our audit work in the area, which I'll wrap up on, the, uh, uh, we're just about, this, this conference is just a bit too early. We would have been able to give you our contaminated sites in Northern Canada audit, which uh, Director Marie-Pierre Grondin, who's here today, is conducting, but she's not, we're not ready to, uh, to issue that before Parliament until April. So at a future conference, we'll tell you about that uh, new audit of contaminated sites in Northern Canada. We did uh, just complete in 2022 our audit of Canada's aging surveillance program uh, in the Arctic in terms of um, uh, the need to um, upgrade its uh, capacity in terms of um, ships, uh, aircraft, satellites, uh, and so on in terms of the uh, increasing geopolitical uh, issues that are occurring in the Arctic and the aging infrastructure that Canada has. So we just completed that one in 2022. And we also did three climate change audits, one for each of the three major, te the three territories in, the, in Canada's Arctic in 27 and 2018. So uh, I'll finish with one last uh, similarity that, uh, um, that I could talk about today between uh, Europe and Canada, and that is, um, is that uh, both in uh, Canada and the United States, and in Europe, we, we seem to all believe that we're the home of Santa Claus. And, uh, and uh, if you tra traverse the, uh, the, the Arctic Circle, if you walk up to the airport and cross, carefully cross the uh, runway where the Arctic Circle runs through, um, actually where it currently runs through because the Arctic Circle can move a tiny bit over large periods of time, but you, you can walk around that perimeter and there's several, several jurisdictions that claim to be the home of Santa Claus, including Russia, Greenland, um, North Pole, Alaska, which is not actually the North Pole, but it's called North Pole, Alaska, um, and Canada as well. So I just thought we could perhaps resolve this geopolitical dispute today by just finding out if, by uh, do any Europeans in the audience have uh, any, any clothing that shows Santa Claus on them today? <laughs> if so, you may, be, uh, you may be crowned the home of Santa Claus. No, that's unfortunate. Uh, I have uh, beard, no. uh, yeah, the beard is not, not white enough, though, Michael. Um, United States, do you have any Santa Claus uh, clothing on today, Mark? No. Not today. Um, actually, I know that he almost did, but his wife told him not to wear a Santa Claus tie today. <laughs> but as a, as a matter of fact, I happen to have one, so I think, uh, I think we will now crown Canada as the home of Santa Claus just for today, and then Finland can regain the crown very soon. <laughs> <laughs> you bought it here. You bought it here. <laughs> Thank you. No, no uh, I, I bought this in Canada. I brought this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Um, excellent. Now we are a bit short of time, so maybe I'll just ask Vivi that will we um, will we finish at one, just so that I know. Ten past, nice. So because I would, I thought that it would be nice after this um, Jerry's reflections that really put us a bit more in the global context when we are going around at least <laughs> the world. If Sanna wanted to comment on this kind of um, um, these audits that have been done that are quite sort of geopolitically sensitive as well because they are about risk management. That did you want to reflect on on what you heard from Michael and Jerry or? Or is that hard from your research perspective? Does this work? Yeah, this works. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it was really interesting to have a chance to read this audit. It was for, for me first time when I'm reading this kind of report, so it was very, very interesting. But uh, I think there was not much um, text about geopolitics as such, so uh, you have to kind of uh, read between lines if you want to comment on that. But of course, the uh, geopolitical situation in the Arctic context has changed really a lot since this uh, report was uh, Danish report was published. So I would 
be very interested in reading the next version, uh, how it reflects the changing situation. But on the other hand, there's so much things that haven't changed. Uh, for example, the report mentions that the, uh, there's a very significant, significant increase in tourism in, in Greenland and other parts of the Arctic. And of course, after the COVID years, now the tourism is booming everywhere in the Arctic. And this poses a new, new and uh, more serious risk uh, when it comes to uh, the safety of people and environmental as well. So what I was wondering when I read this report, uh, I was um, uh, I, I, I was wondering that is there some kind of improvement when it comes to the capability of Danish defense uh, to respond if there's some kind of major acci accidents in this, these waters because also the size of uh, vessels have increased. There might be even vessels that there are eight uh, to 9,000 people and if this kind of really huge vessels uh, have accident in some kind of uh, very remote areas, it would be really a nightmare how to mm -hmm. rescue people. And the other question, of course, uh, concerns environmental impacts of, of these accidents and if there's uh, improved situation when it comes to e equipment to monitor Arctic marine waters and uh, also respond if there is some kind of accidents. Very good. Would you, Michael, want to? Yeah, I think it is on. Yeah. Now it is. Thank you very <laughs> much. Excellent questions. In terms of search and rescue operations and in terms of naval security, I mean, there's been some improvement, um, both internationally and also regarding the Danish legislation. You have to, there's some specific rules regarding ice protection on ships that have to navigate through Greenlandish waters. And also with the International Maritime Organization, as you also mentioned, they had uh, passed the, the Naval Code in 2017, so there are also some regulation in that regard, even in international waters. Um, and also regarding the Danish defense ab ability to, uh, to come to the rescue, I mean, of course, that would always, because it's such a vast area, it will always be in some sort, of, in some sense, it would always be uh, a tricky rescue operation um, to conduct, I think. But what they now, as I also mentioned in my presentation, uh, they have uh, the, in the regulation that at least uh, covers the, uh, the Greenlandish areas where the Danish uh, authorities have some regulatory power, there's, uh, it's mandatory for ships navigating in those waters. If a large cruise ship comes in, they have to notify the authorities that they know where to get assistance if an accident should occur. So, uh, of course, I mean, uh, I'm not sure that uh, it would be possible, for instance, to save 9,000 people because that would require really large ships uh, to take them uh, off the other ship. But at least uh, that there are some uh, some plans uh, that are mandatory for uh, ships to uh, notify the uh, the Danish and Greenlandish authorities if they are navigating in those waters. So, so that's regarding search and rescue. Um, regarding uh, and they also, as I also mentioned in my presentation, the Danish Ministry of Defence have also made increasing the um, made an increase in the amount of equipment that is actually placed in Greenland. So it's not all stuffed in Denmark now. So actually, it's it's where it, sh it should be. Uh, and uh, regarding maritime uh, enforcement uh, of the uh, environmental rules, which was your second question, the Danish authorities now um, bought more or less 20% of the uh, vessels that are navigating through uh, the areas of uh, Greenland in order to check uh, the cargo and uh, if they are... If they are um, um, compliant with the regulation. So, and that was compared to zero before, almost zero at least. Uh, so there's been a, a large improvement, that's also why we, we closed the case. What uh, dragged out, and th th this was done more or less in 2016 and 18, those improvements. Uh, what was lagging was the improvement of the, uh, of the maps of the sea that were uh, necessary to navigate safely and they had those uh, have been finished around 2022 so n everything should be in order now <laughs> excellent thank you um i'm thinking that these um risk management and and um, um 
preparedness is, is very much something that has to do with meteorological data. And I, I warned Petteri that I would ask, but would you want to reflect on these um, kind of resilience and risk management issues and how they now evolve with the changing climate? Yeah, as, uh, as, as we just heard, uh, IMO has established uh, this polar code where, we, where certain standards are set, uh, but unfortunately we are not able to meet those standards so far. And, and, and the challenge is that this Arctic is divided to sectors which are responsibilities of uh, various countries and, uh, and we have difficulties in uh, provision of the, of the safety services to the vessels. And, uh, and, and that's why we are building now a satellite program which, is, which will be a Canadian, US, European program to ensure that there's this tele telecommunication system. And, and also, uh, once we have more open sea area, we can have much higher waves, and we can have also much m more severe backed ice cases. The, the backed I, 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 uh, ice uh, walls may be 10 or even 20 meters high, and, and it's very difficult to cross such conditions. Uh, and uh, I have always been saying that uh, once we have the first uh, oil accident or passenger ship uh, accident taking place in the Arctic, which will be drastic uh, because we, there, are, there are no means to, to rescue 3,000 people from the, from the Arctic. Thereafter, we would create something. But before that happens, uh, I'm afraid that we don't, have, uh, we don't have enough capacity and we don't have enough uh, this kind of safety services for the Arctic. Mm. It like really brings a feeling of remoteness in some way when the, that there is no density of um, this kind of infrastructure. Very good. Do we have an audience question or, or comment, perhaps? Uh, yes, we, um, yes, we have questions on data, exactly on, on meteorological data to Petteri Tala. So we have actually two questions. What data collected by the WMO could auditors use? to show long-term changes in weather parameters? Is the data country-specific? An additional question, how do you assess the state of the meteorological measurements? Are all ind indicators measures which are required to project future climate? Yes, <coughs> so uh, WMO and our community could be regarded as uh, grandfathers of big data. So we have been always uh, freely exchanging data and during my term as Secretary General, we just renewed our data policy and all these kind of basic uh, observational data from uh, ground-based systems, uh, from vessels, aircraft, uh, balloons and satellites, uh, they are made freely available worldwide. And, and, and we are doing it independent of these, these political challenges that we are facing today. Russia gets all the data and they are delivering also their data for global use despite of, of the situation. And, um, and, and we are uh, encouraging the countries to deliver even more data, and, and we have data gaps uh, in less developed parts of the world. And that's why we have a spe specific program to enhance the amount of observations in Africa and in island states, uh, especially Caribbean and Pacific uh, areas. And those are also needed for, for the weather forecasting business, but. Uh, but they are also important for the, for the climate uh, monitoring. For climate monitoring, we have a uh, uh, fairly good uh, data set since 1850. And before that, uh, we, have to go, uh, have, uh, we have to use some indirect uh, means uh, to, to estimate how, how the variation has been. And we have some so-called uh, paleoclimatic means for that. We can, for example, drill the, uh, the Greenland and uh, Antarctic glacier and, and uh, look at the bubbles into ice and, and we, can, we can, for example, estimate uh, how the conditions and greenhouse gas uh, concentrations have been. So we have fairly solid uh, means to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to do these kind of services and we have also fairly solid means to, to, to say what we know about climate. So, so there's not very big uncertainty when it comes to these uh, basic uh, climate change facts. Very good and, and certainly uh, available to all auditors, I am sure. Um, great. So we are coming to an end, and but I wanted to take the discussion to uh, towards what the what the whole meeting is going towards. So we will be talking about indigenous knowledge and and indigenous um, people. And um, I already heard 
really nicely how um, Jerry was talking about the somehow societal um, disparities between the different areas and and um, um, and differentiation in, in that sense. Um, in Finland, we also have this concept of overall security where we um, uh, take the societal uh, kind of balance to be a starting point for, for resilience and, and for um, developing things in a, in a secure fashion. So would you f want to comment first, is there a role for indigenous people in managing risks and, and indigenous people and indigenous knowledge, I mean, um, and how, how is that considered in, in audits in Canada? Yes, uh, thank you. So um, because we have the um, interesting uh, makeup in, uh, in our SI Canada, the Auditor's Gen Auditor General Office of Canada, that we're not only the auditor of the federal government, which is typical, but we are also the audit office of the three territories. So we, we are able to, um, in our territorial audits, we're able to look directly at uh, many of these socioeconomic and environmental issues, but more of, the, more of our audits relate to socioeconomic issues. So we are typically about um, every year issuing um, three different audits, um, specifically targeting um, uh, the three territories where, as I mentioned before, there is a, a large portion of the population who are indigenous. So we we um, we have uh, that as part of our daily work. We also um, have a, an annual conversation with representatives of the Assembly of First Nations, the Inuit organization, and indigenous legislatures on uh, on their priorities that are relevant to our work, and that helps with our selection of topics. Um, we also um, ha have a senior panel of advisors for our office, uh, which includes uh, an indigenous representative. So we get direct input on all of our audits from an indigenous perspective from, from that panel member, um, even, if, uh, even if it doesn't involve directly uh, um, audits relating to indigenous communities. And then we also contract specifically um, uh, experts in um, on the uh, various issues that uh, that are on a on a audit by audit basis, and more directly to your question, especially with environmental issues, but also with the socioeconomic one, um, indigenous knowledge is becoming more and more recognized as a valued source of information, and indigenous communities are becoming in, uh, more of a uh, uh, an important player in negotiations and policy making in Canada. Our unfortunate history um, since European colonization is is one uh, of mistreatment with it, of indigenous peoples in Canada, but there have been, especially in the last 10 or 20 years, steps been taken to rec not only recognize the importance of indigenous peoples, but their, their um, thousands of years of knowledge passed down in, in, uh, in what we would term now a more sustainable, um, uh, sustainable use of the, of the natural resources in the Arctic. Um, so these are some of the challenges, but uh, with Canada's history, it, it, it'll, be, it'll be a long-term project you know, in, terms of, uh, in terms of true reconciliation. Very good and, and really thorough, it sounds. <laughs> Michael, do you encounter indigenous knowledge in your work in any, any way? Um, in this specific audit that we did, we did not uh, go into the Greenlandic authorities because they have a high degree of home rule from 1979 to 2009 and then uh, granted the state of uh, more or less autonom autonomous region in 2009. Um, but it's still under the Danish Commonwealth. But we did not uh, audit that uh, mm. um, in, in, this, uh, in, in this audit that I presented. And um, as far as I remember, we have not done so. Mm. Uh, and also the, um, the local authority in Greenland also have their own auditors. So uh, I guess that's the reason why. Mm. Yeah. Do, you, do you communicate with them? Uh, I have not, uh, yeah. but um, yes, I think we have some, uh, yeah. also in the Faroe Islands, which is also part of the Danish Commonwealth, we have also uh, uh, continued mm. communication with, with them. Yeah. Very good. Excellent. How does this sound, Sanna, from your viewpoint? Uh, does indigenous knowledge play a role in geopolitical um, discussions or, or research? 
Well, I'm afraid it's quite often that uh, if we talk about Arctic geopolitics, you focus on hard security risks and you don't really pay much attention to, to indigenous rights or, uh, or interest of local people in more broad terms. But when it comes to Arctic governance, of course, in the role of indigenous people is very much uh, recognized and valued and, and it should continue to be so. But in my own research, uh, I have now a new research project where we try to uh, envision what would um, or how could uh, Arctic politics and governance look like if we took the rights of nature seriously. And in this process, of course, the viewpoints of indigenous peoples are very important because the conceptions of nature are very much very different from the Western, traditional Western viewpoints where we think that nature is something external to politics, something external of society, and this uh, divide between culture and, and, and environment and so on and so forth. So the the um, organization of rela the, or the practices that uh, that uh, organized relationship between nature and people among indigenous peoples, not only in the Arctic, but elsewhere as well. It's very much of, of importance when it comes to the ways we could rethink our relations with, with, with nature and in order to prevent the ecological crisis from happening. Very good and very interesting um, future research. <laughs> good. Um, Petter, you are an atmospheric scientist and hard facts um, type player in the in the scene <laughs> um, how does indigenous knowledge um, connect with um, does it connect with anything you do of course we have to uh, uh, understand what has been happening uh, in the long long term during the centuries and uh, and there the information is very important but we should keep in mind that uh, if we reach uh, for example two degrees uh, Paris agreement uh, upper limit uh, it would mean that we would see four to five degrees uh, warming here on annual basis and in winter time seven to eight degrees uh, uh, warming and and uh, we expect to see more rainfall in this part of the world so in, in in winter time we may have much more snow in the future but the snowy period will be shorter so there will be big impacts on the on the traditional uh, professions of the of the of the indigenous people in this uh, in the arctic and uh, and that's something that we should keep in mind while raising our ambition level of climate mitigation very good thank you and maybe the kind of laboratory thinking <laughs> comes back here so it has been for me an extreme learning process this um, panel has been very exciting i have learned a lot and i hope you have as well and maybe the take home message i would have here is that that we the regional thinking of environmental and um, auditing and, and knowledge generation challenges is really fruitful and and it helps us um, um, think of um, applicable messages to our own context and I hope the auditors feel the same and uh, for my part I would want to thank the wonderful panelists and and thank the organizers for inviting this session I hope you enjoy your lunch <laughs>